Good morning and welcome to the Bible study for life for Sunday, August the 23rd. This is the fifth in a series of Why Do I Need the Church? And this morning we're going to be talking about strengthening one another as Christians and as church members. And it's going to be taken from the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 8 through 21. Let's ask God to bless our reading and our study today. Father, as we come to this passage of Scripture, help us to realize that all of us are in need of being strengthened, not only by you, but by our fellow man. Help us as church members to realize that strengthening each other helps us to grow in Christ and to prevent Satan from getting a stronghold in our life. Go with us through this study, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. You know, it's dangerous and somewhat foolish to lift a heavy weight without someone else's help. Uh, I go to an exercise class every morning and I realize that uh, those people who are weightlifting, those, now I don't do that, I'm, I'm more a machine fellow, I don't do the weightlifting, but those who do strength train, uh, training know that it's very important to have a spotter. A spotter who is someone who puts more weight on there than you think you can really lift and encourages you to lift that weight. But a spotter is also there in case you get that weight about halfway up and begin to tremble and it falls back on you and he helps grab it and keeps it from injuring you. And so, you know, God's working with us. God's working on us every, every day. And, and he uses others. He uses spotters, in other words, to help us to try more than we actually want to try or to do more than we actually want to do. And he also uses them to help us face the world because if we face it by ourselves, we're facing a difficult task. But if we face it with the help of others, we, we seem to be able to overcome much easier. Living out the theology of redemption encompasses more than just a checklist. Checking off all of the bad things that are in my life, the, the bad habits, the bad speech, uh, the bad emotions that I have. It's more than just checking off the bad ones and checking up the good ones. It, it, it's more than that. It involves a complete life-changing experience. And, uh, and that entails how we walk every day, how we talk every day, how we react every day to what is happening. So it, it's a great thing. It involves, too, uh, a, a thing that the Bible talks about uh, in living as wise people. Living as people that do not continue to live in the foolish lifestyle of an unbeliever, but use the wise things that God wants us to do. It means choosing to submit to the Holy Spirit and what He is telling us and how He is asking us to react and, and not acting to our fleshly appetites, our worldly appetites. And it means also interacting with other Christians so that we can have a, a conscious awareness of where we are and how much we need to grow and where we need to grow uh, in our lives. And to realize we've got brothers and sisters on every side of us that are willing to help us if we will. Paul starts out this lesson this day today saying uh, it, it, he wants us to help finding stand against worldly sins. And this is in Ephesians 5, Ephesians 5 verses 8 through 14. For you were once dark in darkness, but now you are in the light. In the Lord walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the uh, unfruitful works of darkness, and rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by those in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. 
for whatever makes to, uh, whatever manifests in life. Therefore, he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you life. Walk in wisdom. Christians uh, can and should encourage one another. We know that that's a, a, a fact. We, we really need to do that. We need to also be aware uh, of the sinful acts and attitudes and behaviors of the world. In Ephesians 5, 1 to 8, Paul uh, points out the, the clear difference between a non-Christian or an unbeliever and a Christian. And he says their lifestyle is completely different. They have uh, uh, the false things of, of unfruitfulness or non-believers cannot be in partnership with the Christian life and uh, this the pagan lifestyle. Paul uses a, a classic word. Uh, in fact, it is one that you see quite often in if you've ever been to Israel. He presents Christians and non-Christians as darkness and light. If you ever go to the uh, place where all of the Dead Sea Scrolls are, are uh, held and shown, you'll notice that it is black and white. The two contrasting, those things that are in darkness and those things that are in light. The darkness included sinful blindness and ignorance. Paul says, when you were in darkness, you were not only in a black place, but you were blinded and you had ignorance of what was going on. But he says, for Christ, you are in the light of the Lord. And they live as children of the light. Uh, the contrast between light and darkness is a common image throughout the Bible. For example, Jesus told Nicodemus that people love the darkness because it, it hides their evil deeds. And Peter, over in his book, describes salvation as a transformation from darkness to light. And John, in his one of his letters, a small letter, said that God is light and in him there is no darkness. Christians can help, can help to illuminate the world if they will take the light that is within them and be a witness to the world with that light. In verse 9, Paul tells us that the light of Christians' experience is manifested in several ways. He describes the, these as fruits of the light. Now, in some uh, translations of the Bible, you will see this word as true fruits of the Spirit. And, and he says, Paul only names three, goodness, righteousness, and truth. And if you really want the longer list of the fruits of the Spirit, go over to Galatians chapter 5 and verses 22 and 23, you'll get the whole list. Paul knew that his readers needed to develop their moral discernment. Now, new Christians often need Someone to walk, walk alongside. They need someone who is older, someone who is wiser, someone who has already uh, been through the knocks and bruises of Christian life to help them to see and determine what is proper and improper in, in Christian life and their lifestyle. In the letter, Paul serves as a member, as a mentor for those who needed uh, their guidance. He was trying to help them. And uh, not too long ago, maybe several years ago now, I was privileged to teach a class here at Calvary on, on mentoring in the church. And uh, we, we discussed the things that a Christian comes in contact with and how they need to be helped through these things. And I, I'm, I'm just uh, I'm glad to say that there are several here in the church who took that class that have been mentors of new members and of new Christians. And I'm glad to see that. Uh, Paul dealt with uh, uh, this in a general way, but he said he, we need to be mentored. We need to, need to be taken in. He stated that Christians should engage in testing or assessing the moral uh, uh, options that face them. Not too long ago, I was listening to some people who were discussing uh, a, uh, a bill that they were getting into, something that involved a lot of money and everything, and all of a sudden, one of them said, well, isn't that a little shady? 
Well, you know, if I had heard that someone asked me about it and I had heard the word shady, I think I would have said immediately that I was not in. But he went on to discuss and, and you know, we should think about those things that please the Lord. That's what Paul is asking us to do here. He says, I want you to test things. I want you to assess things. And I want you to know that you need to, to please the Lord. I, I'm not certain, but this may have been where uh, the statement, what would Jesus do, came into existence because Paul told the church at Rome that they were to present their bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto uh, the Lord. A, a contemporary uh, analogy of this might be the Christian's assessment uh, of the movies they go to see or the television programs that they have on their, their TV or, or other forms of popular culture. Uh, I think that some of the considerations that need to be made when you look at media like that would be how much nudity is it, uh, what is profanity, uh, how much drug abuse is it, violence. But, you know, they grade the, the movies, uh, different gradings of how violent they are and so forth, and P and PG and so forth. But Paul is saying here, we need to grade, grade every aspect of our lives. We need to test it. We need to assess it. And Paul, he says, uh, I want you to know that these are only examples that he gave. In fact, he only gave three examples. He said uh, that there, there were such, such things as immorality and, and sexual immorality and greed uh, were characteristics of those who did not uh, properly use their Christian walk, but used the world walk. In verse 11, Paul states that Christians should produce certain fruit worthy of their goodness and truth. And, and uh, you know, those who remain in the darkness, uh, they don't produce fruit. There is, you take a plant and you put it into a dark room and you don't give it any light at all, it's going to die. It's going to wither up and die. Rather than producing fruit, it's going to be fruitless. In fact, it's going to be dead. But in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus used the imagery of bearing fruit in, in a little bit different way. For Jesus said his followers produce good fruit like good trees produce good fruit. And he ended up concluding, you shall recognize them by their fruit. You know, a lot of times people say we don't judge people. Oh, no, you shouldn't judge people. But you can certainly judge the fruit. You can judge what fruit they are producing and see whether they're producing good fruit. The vices of sin and the works of the flesh uh, uh, and the virtues of Christ just they don't coexist, and they're traits that need to be disbundled. For we know that the fruit of the Spirit is going to be a good, a good fruit. Christians should not participate in sinful practices of darkness. Paul knew uh, our, uh, well, our avoiding sin and, and uh, crucial to the young minister. And he told, uh, told Timothy, stay away from it. Don't get close to it. Avoid it as a minister. Here Paul encouraged us to expose evil actions. He didn't offer any specific as to how to do it, but early in his chapter he had, he had mentioned uh, immorality and greed and crude joking. Uh, while Paul did not give a comprehensive list, clearly he knew that the first, some of the first 60th century activities were extremely well, he used the word shameful. Uh, I think the debauchery was one of those. Paul knew that exposing sin would lead to a positive change. See, if you don't know what sin is, you don't know how to change from it. So when you turn from light into darkness, uh, you, you, you see the difference. You go into a room, it's dark, you flip the switch and it's light. Everything in that room becomes visible. And Paul had in mind the emphasis in Isaiah's prophecy where he said that the nation of Israel was to be a light to the nations. And Paul is saying that every child of God needs to be a light unto the world. Uh, certainly Christians must help to illuminate a dark world by their witness of their light. In verse 14, 
Paul kind of stumps the scholars because he quotes a, a poem from an unknown source. We don't know where this came from. It, it has some resemblance of some passage of scripture in the Old Testament, but uh, no one really knows where it came from. But what this says, this is a poetic use of an analogy of someone who is asleep. Now, I could understand that if you had said the analogy of someone who was dead, but here he is awakened. He is awakened and Christ who would shine into that person's life. In other words, that person who was asleep was dead to Christ. He had no knowledge of him. And Christ came into his life, so delighting to his life. And his awakening from a sleep was the salvation of his soul. Well, he, uh, he used this image again in First Thessalonians when he said contrast between moral and immoral life. And then he says we need to make better use of our time. Here in 5, chapter 15 through 17, and let's read those two, three little verses. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, in redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand that the will of the Lord is, and do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Here Paul observed that the Christian's view of time is completely different. You know, we think about this whole life and we know we don't know how long it's going to be. Uh, some people live a short life, some people live a long life, but we don't know how long or short it's going to be. But Paul says that we need to know that this life here on earth is not the end that it is not the end of time. When our life ceases here on earth, it begins in heaven. And so his readers need to know that they need to pay careful attention to, to how they live in this life. Uh, becoming a Christian uh, is a life-changing experience. And they had uh, moved from uh, the old self to the new self. <coughs> Excuse me. And they now, uh, as Christians, need to be disciples and learners of the Word of God. Christians uh, with a Jewish background had no problem. They had the Old Testament. They had all the Ten Commandments. They knew what they should and should not do. But these new pagan uh, people who were coming from a pagan background uh, would especially need some guidance. They would need to learn some of the new habits that were uh, before them. We can help one another make wise use of the time. Uh, the little word see then is in the New King James Version. It may not be in your version of the Bible. Shows the importance of making a habit of looking out and watching so that you can be on guard against evil. You can't just blunder into something. You can't run into something without expecting to find uh, some evil there if you don't first look at it. And so he says, I want you to look at it because I want you to be alert and guarding evil. Paul wanted his readers to understand that being a Christian was more than being having a correct theology or a correct doctrinal stance. Uh, it was a way of life. A radical difference, a change in the lifestyle that they had. And he said, I want you to walk circumspectfully, which means I want you to walk prayerfully. I want you to walk carefully. I want you to walk attentively to the circumstances around you for the consequences are, uh, are you, uh, that you are going to receive. You're passing through dangerous ground. You're passing through a, a time of, uh, of dangerous places. It expresses the idea of living in strict conformity uh, to a standard, guarding against anything that would be improper or unbecoming of a Christian. Paul warns them not to live like fools, now, but to live like wise people who are, uh, have a different view of world affairs. You know, a lot of people are worried about death. They're fearful of death. But Paul says wise people will make the right choices 
They will, they will form the right plans. They will employ the right means uh, for service. But the foolish people, they, they just do the opposite. They, they tend to take a hazard, impulsive, uh, whatever it will be, approach to life. But living wisely was critically necessary in the day that these believers were living. The behavior pattern that prevailed in their society, the prevailing fact that, the, in fact, the whole culture, you could look at the whole culture in which these pagan uh, believers were brought up in, uh, it was correctly stated that it was all evil, all evil. So it was very hard. Christians had to live wisely to redeem the time. Now, this is not a clock on the wall. We're not going to watch a clock to see that we're redeeming time well. But even in the midst of evil days, believers are seized the opportunity to do what God, the Lord, desires them to do. Paul urged them to redeem the opportunities before them to make right choices. And, you know, I think every day we get out of bed and we, we say, well, Lord, how many opportunities will I have to witness for you today? How many opportunities will I have to speak for you today? And, and we, we don't know how many opportunities we're going to be given to witness. But Paul says, if we make the right choices, if we make the right choices, God will put before us those opportunities. Uh, this would require understanding what the will of the Lord is. Thus use Christian choices to be determined by understanding the Lord's choice. What is it the Lord wants me to do? Believers will, be, will have faced multiple choices to have their conduct themselves uh, explained for the cause of Christ, to use as a, an example for the cause of Christ. In verse 19, we're invited to a public worship service. A public worship service. You know, public worship is not what it used to be, is it? Uh, used to we we would gather in the auditorium with the place filled to capacity. Now we gather in the auditorium with 70 to 90 people. And, and it's a strange thing to see us scattered out all over the building. But we do not know the exact details of the early church's order of service. You know, we, we usually have a bulletin and... It'll tell us the songs we're going to sing and when we're going to have Bible reading and when we're going to have prayer and so forth and when the preaching is going to happen. We don't have that for the early church. We don't know how they went about it. But we feel and many scholars feel that one of the things that we know that they really put uh, effort on was psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now, they were not the totality of the service. We know that there was an explanation of the word. We know that an apostle or someone got up and, and uh, preached the word. But these three types of music mentioned were total, uh, are not totally separate either. We know that what the Psalms were. Now, you turn to the book of Psalms in the Old Testament, and you know that when the Jewish people met, there were some of those songs Psalms that were hymns, we know that it, it tells the choir master or the person who is leading the music how to lead that psalm in, in the sing, uh, congregation, the singing of that psalm. But we know that, that that's probably what these were based on. They were based on the Old Testament. Well, the Jewish people there would expect it to happen because they grew up with it and they would want the psalms to be sung. But then he says, the spiritual songs and hymns and spiritual songs. Well, we don't know what they were. Uh, we don't know whether we know that in the New Testament there are several places where we can pull out songs, um, hymns from them. They were part of hymns for the early church. But we, we don't know what spiritual songs were. Now, if you're looking at contemporary music and, and the conventional music, we, we know that uh, most of the contemporary music, most of the things that are sung today are taken not from the New Testament, but taken from the Old Testament and the book of Psalms because they're so beautiful. They, they have such hymnology about them. They're able to be sung. And so they, they bring out the words and sing those beautiful hymns. Some Christians today uh, 
debate about which one we could sing. I think we need to sing them all. Because uh, if we do, don't sing them all, then we're leaving some part. If we didn't sing the psalms, we'd leave the Jewish ones out. If we sung the hymns and the spiritual songs, we would, we would leave them out. But if we didn't sing them, we would leave this group out. So we need to sing all of them. We, we need to have a combination of it. Some Christians today also debate how much uh, believers should listen to non-Christian music. Uh, I don't know if... Uh, uh, music and other forms are central in an ongoing discussion about relation to Christ. At least Christians should be cautious about the uh, artistic elements that they, that they listen to, some of the music. You know, the old uh, thing about a computer uh, is, is adage is, is due here. If you put garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. Do you ever listen to the songs that are played or the hymns or music that is played in the background when you, when you go shopping, uh, when you go to any store? More than likely, every one of them is going to have it. If you go into, and I'm going to mention the store here, Hobby Lobby, if you're going into Hobby Lobby, you're going to hear Christian music. You're going to hear contemporary and you're going to hear old standard hymns. But the other day I walked into a store and was looking around for something and uh, I won't tell you the name of the store uh, or the establishment, but uh, uh, I noticed that their music had changed because I'd been in there before several times and I noticed their music was staying, change, had changed and as I listened to the music, I didn't like the words. It was very offensive to me because it was vulgar. It's, it used words that I would never use in my household or never use in my life. I, I, I think they're vulgar and they're nasty. And, and, and the words of the song, it was uh, it, rap music is what they were playing. And it, the song was, was very vulgar. And so I said something to the manager about uh, I didn't appreciate his new song, choice of music. Well, he uh, gave his excuse was that this music was provided by the national change. Well, I haven't been back, and I don't think I'll go back, because if that's the kind of music they play, I just don't care for it. You know, it's likely that verse 20 here still reflects the context of public worship. And, but it might be said that you could explode it from public worship to, to a Christian life in general. For we all know that giving thanks uh, is, is not just a, a, a thanks over the meal, every, every meal. It's more than that. In fact, Paul understood the entire Christian life to be an expression of gratitude to God for his gift of salvation. When he was uh, raising money for the Jewish church, uh, Paul uh, complimented the churches of Macedonia. And he said it this way. He said they first gave themselves. They gave of their selves before they gave their money. He concluded the financial approach with this. Thanks be to God for his undescribable gift. Paul reminded the church of Ephesus that we express our gratitude to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he didn't go into how God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, he didn't go into it, but he says our gratitude for what God has done needs to be expressed based upon the grace of God and the action of his Son, Jesus Christ, as our salvation to us, the grace that he had for each one of us. Verse 21 wraps up the discussion that Paul has had thus far in all of, book, all of the book, all the way through five, uh, verse through five. And indeed, Gates brings us to our next topic, which is the family. Paul presented a general principle that would, be, that would supply in, in many lifestyles, and, and he gives it very, very openly. In the New Testament, Simon Peter says that we need to be submissive, submissive. And, and that is a wonderful thing, to know that we could be submissive to one another, uh, especially related to the, to the family of, of the church. 
And is he applying not only to the family, but to each one of us in the church family, the brothers and sisters in Christ. He also applied this to the political area, uh, arena in Romans 13, 1 through 7. Many people today, both Christians and non-Christians, struggle with the notion of submission. Paul did not promote graveling. Uh, he did not promote total passivity and, and lifestyle. But he did not mean that only Christians should be submissive. The phrase mutual submission carries with it the, the distinctive Christian nature of human relationship. As Christians, we have a submission spirit toward all believers. Paul noted that our submission to others should be based on our fear of Christ. Now, in some of your translations, uh, sometimes this is rendered our reverence for Christ. Now, the word fear kind of, um, well, it's bothersome to a lot of people today. Fear of the Lord or fear of Christ is, is kind of bothersome to readers today. But our first century readers to whom Paul was writing this would, would know that it was an appropriate response to the Son of God. The Old Testament often recognized that wisdom, wisdom was grounded in the fear of the Lord. In the New Testament, is all, that statement is also named, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Well, how are we going to relive this out? How in the world are we going to live all of this that Paul has said in this passage of Scripture of being submissive and uh, 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 of being able to discern the will of God and to look at what we do and to assess what we do and to test. What, how are we going to live it out? While we are responsible for our personal behavior, we have a powerful abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. If I'm going to live this out, I have to have the presence of the Holy Spirit to enable me, to encourage me, to help me, to know the will of God. And I have to have the help of my brothers and sisters in Christ so that I can uh, stand up with them and they can stand up with me. They can counsel me and I can counsel them. They can encourage me and I can encourage them. And above everything else, they can pray for me and I will be praying for them. And what a privilege it is to be uh, that kind of person and be that part of, a, of the body of Christ. You might ask yourself, what recent changes in your lifestyle can you point as evidence that you have made a commitment commitment to godly wisdom, that you're losing the wisdom that God has given you, and you have come to a greater understanding of what the Lord's will is in your life? Maybe you need to check off the things in your life that, that brought you to this or is bringing you to this point of changing your lifestyle. And then can you identify some specific ongoing actions that, that you, maybe you know some things that you really need to take uh, and obey if you're going to fill uh, what the Holy Spirit wants you to do, if you're going to fulfill what God is wanting to do. Therefore, effective in your service towards others, how you're going to improve your lifestyle, how you're going to improve your effectiveness as you witness to others. And then, what has been your attitude towards being submissive? When I looked at this one, I realized that this is one that we all wrestle with. How can we apply this biblical concept to a relationship or situation that you are facing this week or you're going to face next week or maybe one that you have not been able to deal with for a long, long time? But whatever you're doing, Make sure that you're looking at it in Paul's life, that you need to be mutually submissive one to another. I hope that uh, you've enjoyed the five lessons we've had so far. Next Sunday will be our last lesson, and why do I need the, the church? And we'll talk about putting on the whole armor of, law, of God. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you this day Realizing that what you have asked the church here at Ephesus to do, you're asking us to do today. You know, we need to be walking as children of light. We, we need have to find out what is really acceptable to the Lord. 
Every day we need to make sure that we're not doing something that is shameful in the eyes of the Lord. That we expose those things that are that are harmful. That we expose those things that, that are secret in our life that need to be brought out. And Father, we just pray that you'll help us to walk in wisdom. That we'll walk in a way that will glorify you. That will lift up your kingdom. That will give your son Jesus Christ all of the glory. And Father, we pray that you will help us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that we will have that mutual submission one to another through the fear of God. Because we know that God would want us to do that. And Father, just lead and guide us through this week. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.